uh, but you're but you're free to send us uh, questions by the chat box on your screen, and we'll try to answer them at some point during the program. Then at the end of the program, I'll try to answer any additional questions and encourage you to join me in a discussion of the topics raised. Uh, near the end, we'll be showing you some case studies, which we can comment on and discuss further after the initial program. Well, welcome to Visana Seminars. This is a series of educational programs intended to inform and educate viewers about the art of viewing stone appreciation. We believe that an informed stone collector is on the way to becoming a stone connoisseur. Today's program, the role of carved wood bases uh, in stone appreciation will explore the many diverse types of bases used in China, Korea, Japan, North America, and Europe. Our goal is to provide you with accurate information about wood bases and not show a particular bias for any one country. Now, today I've sought the help of four internationally known base carvers. Uh, Chen Shi Hong in Shanghai is uh, one of the leading wood carvers and artist in China. He's won many awards in this country and is widely recognized in China as being one of the most progressive and innovative base carvers. Next uh, on the left is Mr. Hirata, who's now considered by many to be Japan's premier base carver. Uh, he does excellent work and his bases are in any major private collection in Japan and overseas. The, the fellow with the brown cap is Al Nelson from Southern California. Al has been making bases for over 40 years and uh, is an excellent wood carver. And he too is well known for his artistic skills. Then the youngest member of the bunch, Sandro Sudin from Switzerland, is a master carver and artist. And we, I sent each of these people a list of questions and they responded to them and their answers will be included in the program today. So it's not just me talking about bases, but you'll get the thoughts of these four masters uh, as we progress through the program. Now, once we acquire a good stone, one of the first challenges we face is how to display it. An effective display is the key to the viewing experience. The two most common methods of displaying a stone are using a carved wood base or displaying the stone in a tray ceramic or metal, usually with sand. Now there are other ways, but today we're going to focus solely on the carved wood bases. Now a carved wood base is a custom made for a single stone, for a specific stone, to, in order to convey an impression. And the base should be in complete harmony with the stone. Trays are used to recreate sceneries. They can be used with different stones, and that also the tray should be in harmony with the uh, stone. Now, Jan Stewart, an internationally known scholar of Chinese art, <clears throat> wrote an important chapter on the role of bases and display pedestals in Robert Mowry's book, World Within Worlds. In this chapter, she informs us of the long history and importance of bases in the, view, in the viewing of art objects. The earliest documentation that she found where rocks were placed on stands made of wood, mainly lacquered wood, date to the 14th century. So for 700 years, we've been used seeing stones displayed on wood bases. So it truly is an uh, ancient, art form, ancient way of displaying 
stones. So we're gonna look at it in a little more detail today. Jane Stewart went on to say that a stand is critical to the appreciation of an object that is especially clear in the case of rocks. Enjoyment of a rock can be dramatically enhanced by a well-chosen display stand. In this case, this is a red Kucharo stone from Northern Japan, from the island of Hokkaido. Using low tables and stone basins to display stones is well documented in Imperial Japan. And in evidence points out multiple cases of point out where the stones were first displayed in on bronze trays in stone basins and then on stone plinths. Later, they were displayed on low tables, platforms, and cloth <clears throat> before the development of the lip and socket bases. In this case, on the left, we have a Ming Dynasty style Ling B stone that's simply resting, sitting on a Qing Dynasty spindle table. To the right is a Taihu stone that's being displayed in a carved stone basin with uh, larger rocks or pebbles. And this was the way scholars believe <clears throat> that the first indoor stones were displayed. Some of the early bases were made from softer wood, such as elm. And the use of harder woods, Z tan, rosewood, and Wang Wei came in later. Now, furniture was a valuable and scarce commodity in the early dynasties. Low tables were used for many purposes writing, eating, temporary displays, offerings, uh, and other uses. So, the use of a dedicated piece of wood to serve as a permanent base for a stone freed the other furniture for its intended uses. Now, the stone on, illustrated on the right is attributed to the Ming Dynasty very early, and the base is elm. And this is a platform, low platform type of base. And on the left is a Ling B stone on a modern uh, platform style base. And it's believed that many of the early horizontally oriented bases were, I mean, stones were displayed on these low uh, platform type of bases. <clears throat> Jian Li maintains that the first carved wood bases developed in the pre-Ming dynasty. And by the middle Qing dynasty, distinct, seven distinct types of wood bases could be identified in different parts of China. Uh, this is a more recent study, to, uh, and I think it's probably more accurate. Uh, Dr. Stewart's study was older and felt that it was uh, Ming Dynasty developed a period when wood bases first appeared. But we're never going to know for sure. This is an illustration of what is believed to be one of the earlier types of bases, uh, pre-Ming or Ming, early Ming Dynasty. And the different types of bases reflect regional differences and the different types of armentation and carving on the base. <clears throat> now, the evolution of the socket and lip type of base came with a need to display more vertically oriented stones. And to do this, there was a socket in which the stone sat in a raised lip that would help support the stone. Uh, the socket is in here in this part of the base and the lip uh, is up higher. And this provides more support because the these custom-made stands had to take the weight and structure <clears throat> needed to balance a rock, and it was essential for 
displaying vertically oriented rocks. So the lip and socket type of base came a little later and facilitated the use of vertically oriented rocks as well as horizontal. <clears throat> Here is a case you can see the socket in this uh, northern style base. The bases on the left here, here, and here are more traditional style bases. This is a table style base. Uh, and, and these two are known as more northern style. The one to the lower left is, has been called a southern style that you might see in Guangdong province with more elaborate carving, <clears throat> often with a theme. It may be waves, pine branches, money, uh, and typically without legs. Now, as I mentioned, Jian Li uh, recognized seven different types, and this is just two of the types here. On the right are the more contemporary style bases uh, with elaborate carving. In the one in the upper right, you have <clears throat> uh, a base that gives the impression of waves coming up, splashing over, cresting, fish jumping up out of it. So it's a sea or water motif to this base. The one in the lower right uh, is holds a, a Gobi Desert stone, irregular shaped abstract shape stone. And the base carver uh, followed that form and pattern uh, of the rock with the base. So it looks like one element. So you have the contemporary types of bases on the right, traditional on the left. Now the Chinese table style bases are not one piece of wood, but they're assembled from several pieces. The short cabriole legs are made separately along with the stretchers, these long horizontally oriented pieces that provide support to the legs. <clears throat> And then the upper part, the main part, these are made separately and then they're glued together and then covered with lacquer. For larger stones, it requires more uh, elaborate equipment, pulleys, chains, so that the stone can be raised and lowered as the uh, base is manufactured. And this is a shop in a Shanghai Stone Market. It was one of the uh, leading shops and before this uh, market closed down. <clears throat> Originally, bases were hand carved using small, narrow chisels. And a base carver might have 30 or 40 different chisels, different size and shape chisels. And they would spend a several weeks or a month or more on making a single large base. Uh, obviously this was time, uh, time consuming, but it gave time for artistic talent to show up. Today in China, uh, many bases are made with a combination of power tools as well as some hand carving. In this Shanghai studio, woodworking studio, Chen Shi Hong's, we can see two workers work carving bases using a powered uh, chisel or power cutter. He's holding the piece in his hand and cutting it here. And he has the pattern drawn, the scheme for the base in front of him. And here's the base being assembled here. So we do see in shops, uh, today throughout China and many parts of the world, the use of more hand tools and the use of hand tools uh, permits more intricate carving and more detailed carving and also permits greater artistic expression. Now, obviously to have this kind of uh, detailed carving, you must have harder wood. This particular piece uh, takes a small California desert stone, perhaps an agate. And uh, Mr. Chin Shi Hong <clears throat> designed and had carved this bird's nest sitting on a branch in a tree. 
a single leaf and then attached a worm to it. All, all of these are hand carved uh, pieces or machine carved uh, to create a impression of a bird's nest. And Chin Shi Hong wrote, nature has created the stones, but artists create stone art. Now, the power of the base can convey a message can be very strong. In some cases, it's modest. In other cases, it's uh, the primary object in helping to convey the message. Here we have a Chinese river stone, just uh, looks like a large potato, and uh, but it's fairly, it's six and a half pounds. And the base carver took a piece of wood and carved the lower part of a frog to give the impression that this is a frog. And it does make an effective display. Now, some stone collectors will say, oh, this is too obvious, too explicit. However, in China, this is perfectly acceptable. Um, whereas in Japan and some other and some other people believe that it should be more suggestive rather than explicit. But it doesn't really matter to me because I respect the feelings of people in China and in other countries. And so uh, I'm perfectly fine to see differences of opinion that exists within the viewing stone community. But you can see here how the base turned that round stone into a uh, image, into a figure. I also noticed that the use of natural root masses to serve as a base for a stone, it appears to have originated in China. And they take, literally take the root mass from a tree that's been cut down pull it out of the earth, let it dry, clean it, and then begin to shape it and, and form a seat for a stone. I haven't seen this done widely in other countries, and it can be very effective. Here you have a large Chinese uh, chrysanthemum flower stone <clears throat> resting in this natural wood base. I've also seen smaller examples where they've taken various pieces of root and glued them together to create a, a root-like base for stones. In Korea, we noticed that the bases have a distinct features and they appear to be intermediate between Chinese and Japanese style bases. <clears throat> the base often conforms to the lower part of the stone they tend to have more obvious conspicuous feet on the bases, and in some cases exaggerated. Uh, and I don't know the uh, meaning of these very large uh, legs on such a short base. And they also tend to have uh, more obvious or conspicuous lips to the stone to help support it. Uh, many, some of the bases, many of the bases in Korea are stained to a, a dark finish, dark color, but some of the stones <clears throat> are left in their natural, the bases are left in their natural condition to expose the grain of the wood and to use the lighter color to complement the lighter colored uh, stones. Now, I believe that the Korean bases are intermediate between the more elaborate Chinese bases and the minim minimalist style in found in Japanese dices. And in the Korean bases, we can see influences from both China early on and Japan later. Uh, we're just beginning to obtain more accurate information about Korean stone appreciation. And we expect to incorporate more information about the long history of collecting and displaying unusual stones in Korea in the future. <clears throat> in Japanese style bases, the base is subordinate to the stone 
and typically has more subtle features. Notice how the feet are smaller and they're more recessed under the base. Uh, there's a, generally a lack of deta detailed carving on the sides of the base. And these small feet and lack of decorative details are part of the expression of the concept of understated beauty in Japanese stone aesthetics. Now, the Japanese suiseki practices are well known in North America, Europe, other regions, more so than Chinese and Japanese practices. Because of this, most Western stone enthusiasts follow the Japanese standards. Here we can see some examples of Japanese bases, fairly simple lines, no decoration. The, there's a raised lip here, but it's very inconspicuous and fills in a gap. The exceptions to these low simple bases can be seen in the display of certain figure stones, as you see here. And these stones are often displayed on pedestal style bases. Buddha and Buddha-like figures are sometimes displayed on pedestals with a lotus flower theme. And this may be influenced from uh, the Chinese traditions, <clears throat> but further investigation will, uh, will bear that out. Here we are in the studio of Harada, Harada Kazuya, where he's studying the stone carefully to decide what type of base to make for it. He uses a combination of power tools and chisels to make really superior bases for Japanese stones. In Japan, we don't find regional variations as we do in China. There's no Northern, Southern, Western, Eastern style. And it's, this may be due to the smaller size of, of Japan, its homogeneous population. If you look in Hokkaido, you will see uh, basically the same type of bases that you find in the Southern regions or in Central uh, Japan. The Faria stones from Wakayama are sometimes have a little more decoration on them, are a little more elaborate with the shoulders and more elaborate scroll type of feet. This space was made by Mr. the late Tammy, Tani Moto, a well-known base carver and collector of Faria stones. So with that introduction, let's look at, turn to our experts <clears throat> and see what is the role of the base or Diza in viewing stone appreciation. Mr. Chin Shi Hong wrote, the function of the base is to place the stone and the position depends on the theme and the need. The shape of each stone is different and the angle of wood is different in order to echo the shape and the interior spirit of the stone. It is necessary to continually, continuously innovate the style, decoration and shape of the base. The style of the base for a stone is not fixed. It is full of challenges and creativity. The producer of the base needs to be skillful, skillful, skilled in craftsmanship and have very broad artistic ideas, fully equipped with creative enthusiasm and ideas on design. <clears throat> we'll turn now to Mr. Hirata, Japan. The stone is the main object and the Daiza is a supporting role. The most important is the harmony between the stone and Daiza to create a feeling of oneness between the stone and Daiza. Al Nelson <clears throat> has a very succinct response to this. The role of the base is to show the stone's maximum beauty and to its best advantage. Uh, very meaningful statement with very few words. Sandro wrote that the Diza fulfills several functions, practical, aesthetic, and philo philosophical. 
Its primary purpose is to keep the stone in its best, most balanced position and to conceal its base. A good dyza takes the gestures of the stone and continues them in the wood. So there is a unity between stone and wood. It rounds off the composition and yet remains in the background. In the best case, the dyza draws the viewer's attention to certain characteristics of the stone that would not be so apparent without it. A dyza stimulates the viewer's imagination, inviting them to experience their own pictures and stories in Suiseki. It is important that it leaves enough room for the viewer's imagination and does not narrow the message down too much. Well, let's turn now to <clears throat> what types of wood are used it, to make bases. Most of the woods come from flowering trees, angiosperms, rather than from cone bearing trees. And the wood from flowering trees ranges from very soft to extremely dense and hard. Some will even sink in water. But the best bases are usually are strong, fine grained, uniform texture, resistant to splitting, have the ability to be sanded to a smooth finish and stained. In this photograph, we have a Italian Palombino stone, limestone, resting on a piece of black walnut uh, it, at the very beginning stages of making a base for this stone. <clears throat> We know that a wide variety of woods are used uh, and that these woods vary in hardness. At the lower end, we find bases made from basswood and, and aspen or poplars. And these are easy to carve and they have a very low rating of 350 to 410. At the other end, we find some of the rosewoods and zetan and Brazilian ebony are rated up at the 2,000 to 3,600. What does this mean? The Janka rating system is based on how many pounds of force it takes to embed a steel ball, roughly a half an inch in diameter, into a wood until half of the ball has sunk into the wood. So the higher the rating, the harder the wood. Black walnut and different species of rosewood are the most commonly used woods for carving bases. Although in some countries such as Australia, they successfully using their native woods to carve bases. Now, I just want to mention about rosewood for a second. Rosewoods belong to a genus Dalbergia in the legume family. They occur in Africa, tropical Africa, uh, tropical America and tropical Asia. There are many species of rosewoods and they vary in hardness and color. The, most of them are suitable for making furniture. So it's a highly desired wood. But when you speak of rosewoods, it's really you're talking about a cluster of different species of rosewood, a species of trees. Let's look at a softwood versus hardwood base now. On the left is a uh, very soft wood, either uh, populus or uh, bass, bass, bass wood. They're easy to carve, take much less time. So they are less expensive to make or if you're paying for it to purchase. The wood grain is usually more open and coarse, usually requires painting. A flat black paint is used on most of these. They're not as strong as a harder base and the paint will chip. They will chip uh, if they're handled uh, too much. On the right is a base made from black walnut. It requires greater carving skills, takes more time. And as a result, the hardwood bases are more expensive. But one of the benefits is they have the wood grain is fine, can be sanded and left in a natural finish or stained. These bases are stronger and more durable and less subject to chipping and damage than a softwood base. 
Now let's look at this Trinity, California Trinity River stone, pattern stone. On the left, you can see that the base covers the lower part of the stone. It's pretty much of a flat, uh, a generic type of base holder for a stone. The, sto the base on the right, I, I had it made, asked for it to be made to conform to the sh shape of the stone so that more of the stone is exposed. So you can see the pattern. And it's the surface patterns on this stone that make it uh, really exceptional. I also like the bases that conform to the shape of the stone, as you can see here and on this side. So in this case, I feel that the base and stone are more harmonious, work together as one unit, than here with these contrasting elements. So if the stone and base come together successfully, it can, it can appear as just simply one element. Now, in China, you sometimes see large, elaborate bases. Well, these are often several pieces that have been made, manufactured, carved, and then glued together. The upper part, the elaborately carved upper part that holds the stone is one piece made from one piece of wood. The middle part is made from another piece of wood. And then the bottom is from made from a third larger piece. Once these are all sanded and finished, they're glued together. And then they're covered with lacquer, with a fairly thick lacquer that hides the pieces. And it looks like a single piece of wood was used to make the base when in fact it was composed of several. In this case, Mr. Chin Shi Hong uh, designed a base, he drew the sketch to hold two stones. And then the, the sketch was taken and four pieces of wood was used to make this base. One piece for one figure, a second piece for another figure, a third piece for this uh, looks like a grapevine growing up, and then a large flat piece for the base. So these are made and then finished, glued together, and then covered with lacquer. Now, Mr. Hong says that contemporary artists have brought new artistic concepts and new expressions into the world of stone appreciation, triggering the creation of rare stone artwork and provoking interest in creating more artwork in the viewing stone world. So Mr. Hong is on the cutting edge of contemporary stone displays in China. Well, another question comes, well, how many legs should a base have? I've heard people say that it has to be an even number, an odd number, uh, and where should they be placed? Are there guidelines? And we were visiting our an old friend, the late Suzuki Koji at his house. And I asked him, where should, how many legs should a stone have and where should they be? He smiled and said, the stone will tell you where to place the base. He picked up a stone and turned it over. We looked at the lower side of it. And quite clearly, the stone is telling us where the legs should be. So from my viewpoint, there's not a fixed number or location, but it's the key places on the stone. Now, our friend from Switzerland, Sandro, stated that, wrote to us and said, feet raise the stone from the profane. They can be a decorative element and they can indicate the gravity lines of stone. Gravity lines are the axes where most of the visual weight lies. The feet must lie precisely on these axes and also point the specific direction. This is the only way for the stone to transfer its weight correctly to the ground and appear harmonious. I've also noticed that in China, especially in traditional or classical Chinese bases, that a additional leg is added to the base. And the purpose of this additional leg here and here is to indicate the front of the stone. 
So there's no question about the front and back. The owner of the stone and the wood carver has gotten together and decided this is the front view. So let's place a leg there and to so people know this. Now, this is not always followed. It depends upon the level of knowledge of the owner and the base maker if this, this is used, because I see uh, bases, table style bases with four legs, and I also see them with five. Usually the ones with five are better quality bases. I next ask our experts, who determines what type of base to make for a stone? The owner, the base carver, or somebody, someone or something else? Mr. Hong wrote, the design and creation of a base must get ideas from other artistic essences. Then the stone will gain greater benefits. It's almost like giving the stone a performance stage, forming a strong cultural atmosphere. The design of a base is a study of stone and wood, the coordination of virtual reality, balance, movement, and stillness because each stone is different. So each should match with all of the above. Uh, now, Mr. Harada wrote that a Daisa cannot be created without understanding the stone. The design of the Daisa usually is determined by the owner of the stone and the Daisa carver. The relationship between the owner and Daisa maker is equal. This is Mr. Hirata's viewpoint. If we look at uh, Sandro, the stone decides what type of Daisa must be created. I learn to listen to stones. I fully engage with their effect and feel what character they have. I get more clues as to what the Daisa should be like from the shape of the stone, its surface, the color and the patina. These aspects, apart from the stone's temper, also dictate what design I should aim for, so that not a standard Daisa, but a tailor-made work of art can be created. Now we'll turn to Al Nelson, and you might want to turn your volume up a little bit. But How do you determine what kind of base to make for a stone? It depends on uh, what the stone gives us to make a base. And I like to make my bases in the Japanese tradition. I think it's the most beautiful. And I'm gonna show the stone. I want the stone to be the primary object. So <clears throat> when one views the stone, they're gonna see the stone. We want their eye to go to the stone <clears throat> and not the base. Okay, we'll now turn and look at uh, some other aspects of bases. We're seeing now innovation and creativity in modern style bases as they're being made. This one was designed and constructed by Tony Anglewitz, and it really shows the skill of an artist and base maker in combining a base with a, with a stone to create a one artistic element. And Mr. Hong wrote to us that the process of creating stone art should encourage contemporary artists to bring new concepts and new expression methods into the world of stone appreciation and elevate interest in the creation of stone artworks. Now, the orientation of the stone will have a definite effect on the type of base to make for it. And the center, we have the, in this orientation, the stone has a low center of gravity. So a low platform style base was made for it to fit better with the overall shape of the stone. In this case, where the stone is in a different orientation, a more traditional type of base was made for it. And then on the far left, when this orientation, the stone is delicately balanced on its narrowest point. And so Patrick Mativa, who made this base, 
made a more substantial table-like base to show strength in supporting this stone. So the orientation you take can influence the type of uh, base to make for it. In this case, we have one stone that can be displayed in five different positions. In the upright position here and here, a more traditional northern style Chinese bases were made for it with conspicuous legs raising it up off the ground. In the horizontal position, a more of a platform style base with uh, some lips uh, present here, but absent here, have been used for this stone. So it creates a different mood, a different feeling uh, with the base and stone combined. So here you can see how the orientation, again, how the orientation will help determine the type of stone. Now we'll take a short, quick look at some of the finishes. Uh, many bases are, once they've been carved and sanded, are stained, treated with lacquer, oils, paints, to influence the feeling of a stone and the base maker. And st stains may be mixed with water, lacquer, polyurethane, varnish, shellac. And we find that the majority of car bases are stained to darken the color to make it less conspicuous and more harmonious with the color of the uh, stones. And the color and finish of the base should harmonize with the color of the stone, its texture and pattern. Let's look at this example where we had a base made for a, an Italian Ligurian figure stone. The base was made by Phil Hogan. It was made from a maple, which is a lighter, has a natural lighter color. Uh, but when I was looking at this stone, I felt that it wasn't quite as harmonious with this stone as I would like. It didn't come together as a, uh, in a feeling of oneness. So I asked Phil to darken the base which he did. And for me, this combination is more in harmony than this combination, or the combination between the base and the stone. So my preference is for this, this configuration, this color of the base for this stone. This base was made from rosewood and it was rubbed three different times, three layers of a soft paste wax lacquer made from sumac from uh, China. It was done by Mr. Hirata. It seems that each base maker carver has its own techniques and procedures for finishing a base. Some hand rub it uh, and, and some use multiple layers and different materials, but it's the uh, ending finish that is really what is important. Lacquer is used in China, uh, throughout China. It's a solvent type of base. It usually leaves a very glossy finish on the base and consists of sh shellac dissolved in alcohol. You can add other material to it. Uh, carbon you can, can be added to create a black lacquer. Cinnabar or some other less toxic material can be added to create the red lacquer. And these are used to get to get what is known as our common Chinese finish to its bases. But this is why Chinese bases often appear shinier than in many Japanese bases. It just depends upon the material used for the, for the final stage of finishing. In Korea, we've noticed that the natural grain of the wood is used uh, in the display of a number of stones. Sometimes it's used with lighter color stones, but not always. And we're not sure of why this is the case, but we hope to find out in the future. And in this Korean stone, you not only see the natural finish, but the grain of the wood, larger feet, more prominent lips to it to hold the stone in place. 
in some cases, the wood is, uh, is finished in its natural color and then just treated with a clear oil to preserve it. And in this case, it requires a, a knowledge of the different woods and its, its color. And in this case, Sandro selected the, a Brazilian ebony to match the dark color of this turtle pattern stone. He chose dark ebony because it's extremely hard. And because it's hard, you can do intricate carving with it. And so he made this base uh, with water splashing as a stone drops into water, it's splashing out. And rather than stain it, he just treated it with a clear natural oil. So this is a wonderful thing if you can accomplish it of matching the color, natural color of the wood with the natural color of the stone. But it's only, you can do this only if you have a adequate supply of different woods. Al Nelson made this base for me <clears throat> in January 1997. This is a stone I collected when I was in South Africa, a, a landscape stone, a butte, maybe a cave, and brought it back. And Al made this base and left it in its natural finish because the stone has a lighter color to it. And so he left a the lighter color base to complement and uh, be in harmony with the two rather than contrasting. Well, let's look at three case studies now. The first one is a New Zealand nephrite jade that we got when we were in New Zealand in uh, 2009. I was fascinated with this stone because when I first saw it, I had the impression of a whale, whale breaching, and um, or a sperm whale coming up to eat, chasing a squid, perhaps. So I brought this the stone back and had a base made for it 12 years ago. When I gave it to the base carver, I said, I want the feeling of water, give the impression of the this whale-like stone is surfacing from the water. But the more I looked at it over the years, I was not completely satisfied with it. So I took it to Xin Chi Hong in Shanghai. And I said, I want the whale breaching coming out of the water. It's a very dramatic, it's a very strong statement, uh, explosive. And I'd like for this feeling to be shown in the base. So he made this base from rosewood, which can be intricately carved. And to me, this is much more a much more dynamic display of this figure stone. The third case is taking a small Japanese Kanemu Kotan stone. This is basalt, weathered basalt. And when I when we acquired this stone several years ago, it came with this base. And as I looked at it and studied it, viewed it, I said, I don't like the feet on this. They're too prominent. And the lip is too prominent. And this face bothers me. So I took this stone to Mr. Harada in Nagoya, and he made this base. The space was filled in with a lip that was raised to support the stone. The contours of the stone and base are uh, match, they're more harmonious. The legs are smaller and not so conspicuous. And for me, these two elements are more harmonious. When I look at it, I can see one uh, figure, one object. When I look at this one, I see two objects, a conspicuous base and a beautiful stone. Now you may disagree with me and that's fine that I don't expect people to agree with my own uh, thoughts on aesthetics and beauty. Mm. The other case, other case study is of a Tama River stone. It's a boat shaped stone. Um, about 21 centimeters wide, a little over 10 inches. 
And I bought this stone in Hokkaido, Sapporo, in Hokkaido, the northernmost island. And it came with this base. It's a cup-shaped base holding the bow of it, the front of it, very high. And then these legs. And I found that it wasn't very steady. It tended to rock. And uh, I, I didn't like this, uh, the fragile nature of this display. Also, I didn't feel that these legs were appropriate for a bolt-shaped stone. So, and I noticed that many of the bolt-shaped stones when they're displayed look like a boat simply at anchor resting in the water. So we took this stone to uh, Mr. Hirata in Japan and we sat and talked. I said, what I'd like to achieve here is the feeling of a boat moving through water, of motion. And can you help me do that? And so we talked about it. He made some sketches. And then he came up with this base. This is the bow of the boat as it's plowing through the water. The water is trailing along the side of the ship and then leaving this wake behind it. In this case, I asked Mr. Harada to be creative. Don't just make a traditional Japanese base in the, uh, that's completely subordinate, uh, subtle, uh, make it more expressive. And this is what he came up with, with this base here. The, the bow is a little lower, which is, uh, more realistic. And as I see this, I can just imagine the boat moving through the water. So to summarize what I message I've been trying to get across today is that <clears throat> what is most important is the harmony and feeling of oneness between the stone and the base. And I think that this is basically what the four specialists, the four master stone carver has also been saying to us. I've also taken from their messages that let the stone determine the type of base needed to display it. Carefully study the features of the stone and design a base that will best enhance and complement the stone. The one type of base fits all stones, it just doesn't work. I also believe that the stone should be the primary focal point in a display. Now the base should be strong enough to securely hold the stone and display it in the desired orientation. A poorly seated stone or one that is delicately balanced is not good. There are many options in the design and construction of suitable bases, ranging from the minimalist to elaborate styles and from traditional to contemporary. You're not locked in, you have choices. And finally, bases can be regional in style and reflect the customs and cultural history and practices of each country, or you can follow the traditional Chinese, Japanese, and Korean styles, depending upon a stone's features and origin. I want to thank Ken Tay, Philip, and Michi Ho for translating a very difficult passage from Mandarin Chinese to English to Mr. Nishiyama for helping me gather information in Japan and for Hiromi Nakaoji for translating Japanese to English. And I owe a special thanks to our four master woodcarvers who helped make this presentation possible. Chen Shi Hong, Arata, Zuya, Al Nelson, Zandro, Juten in Switzerland. So at this point, I'm going to open the session to questions and comments, and let's have a uh, lively and interesting discussion. Okay.